so thank you very much. Let's move to Germany now, the German Empire. And uh, I'd like to start my talk, my presentation about the fundraising campaign connected to the so-called Tendagur expedition uh, by showing a couple of numbers. So, uh, the 19th century, um, the 19th century annual personal budget of the Stuttgart Museum of Natural History um, was uh, was fixed at 20,000 marks. Uh, whereas in order to attract the physicist Friedrich Kollerausch uh, to the Physikalische Technische Reichsstand, uh, so the National Meteor Meteorology Institute in Berlin Charlottenburg, the Ministry of Interior was ready to pay him uh, 18,900 marks per year. That means almost the entire amount of money available for Stuttgart. Or the 1905 operating budget of the Physikalisch Technische Reichsanstalt, so the Institute, came to 40,000 marks. Why? Between 1911, 1909, sorry, 1911, the entire budget of the Berlin Geological Paleontological Museums of Natural History am amounted only to seven. Uh, 17,300 um, marks. Thus, during the first decades of the, 20, of the 20th century, it seems that industrial based sciences, as physics, chemistry, etc., obtained much more uh, financial support than, the, than, than what natural history did. Considering this point, considering the lack of present interest in natural history, as the numbers show, as, as the number show uh, German paleontologist Otto Jekyll remarked. Like anything that does not bring in any money, there seems to be the slight interest in natural history in Prussia. Let's now focus on another kind of numbers. This table shows uh, the uh, budget of the first two excavation seasons of the so-called Pendaguro expeditions. As um, Barak yesterday said, this was one of the most successful paleontological expeditions of the 20th century. Uh, between 1909 and 1913, Berlin's Museum von Naturkunde unearthed more than 225 tons of fossils near Tindaguro in former German East <coughs> Africa, today Tanzania, and transported them to Berlin. Among them, there were the bones of the of the Brachiosaurus, which would eventually become the largest mounted, the, the biggest, sorry, the biggest mounted dinosaurs uh, in the world. Yet, um, back to numbers. The first two um, um, excavation incisions of the German expedition were mainly financed by uh, private citizens, yeah. uh, who donated a total of about 1,027 German marks. Um, the process central state was less generous. Even the Berlin uh, Society of Friends of Natural History, at the Lord, it's lucky. So, um, uh, yeah, this one. Uh, and the Berlin city, Berlin, yeah, uh, donated more than uh, the central state did, making a contribution respectively of 20,000, yeah, 20,000, and 800, um, and 800, and uh, sorry, 8,000 German marks. Whereas the, trend, the process central state gave a mere 5,000 marks. Yeah. Uh, however, the process state decided to become uh, more closely involved in the expedition, making a large donation of 25, of, uh, of um, 25, um, 45,000 marks to the 1912 ex uh, ex excavation season. So why and how this happened? Well, in the next 15 minutes, I'd like to attempt to answer two questions which emerge from the analysis of these numbers. First, why did Prussian state decide to support a discipline detached from industry, like vertebrate paleontology? And second, how could political tension be captured and directed towards the promotion of paleontology, given the lack of interest in natural history during the Kaiserreich, during the German Empire? Or to put it differently, how could paleontology acquire <coughs> an institutional, social, and scientific value in a society that put a premium on the industrialization of science? The answer to these questions lies in William von Branca's fundraising campaign. William von Branca was the director of the Ge Geological Paleontological Museum in Berlin. He conducted a highly successful campaign to mark the importance of dinosaurs in Prussia and to convince public opinion and the Prussian central state of the value of paleontology. Branca used dinosaurs to um, underpin and spread his notion of natural history as a synthetic activity 
to merge paleontology and to merge paleontological with geological research and to establish the Berlin Museum as the National Prussian Museum for Natural History and Paleontology. Let's now focus on Branca's rhetoric. Branca's communicative strategy was extremely simple and at the, at the same time effective. His strategy was try to conjure up dinosaurs before the eyes of the public and the Prussian government. In order to do that, he focused on two main aspects. The exceptional enormous size of bones discovered in Tanzania and the international prestige linked to this expedition. He presents the finds in these terms to a significant number of different audiences and in order to mobilize a great deal of financial resources, in order to mobilize a great deal of financial resources, uh, consensus and sponsorship. In other words, he marked Tendaguru and with it his idea of natural history. In his first approach to the, both the Ministry of Education and Cultural Affairs and the Commission for the Geographic Exploration of the German Protectorates, Branca sought to present his finds in all their majesty. He described the finds seeking to visually recreate the immense size of, of these dinosaurs so that people would have, would have an image of them in their minds long before the bones arrived in Berlin. Moreover, Branca emphasized the significance of these bones for a much more concrete purpose, to enhance the prestige of German science and the German empire. Not only would German paleontology benefit from this excavation, but German science as a whole would undoubtedly receive a boost to its international reputation, since, and I quote, these are much younger than already well-known North American dinosaurs, Germany will be able to push the possession of enormous fossils that, at least temporarily, would outdo the American finds. Thus, in this, uh, in this, in this first attempt, Branca was using a well-established public relations strategy to place Germany, paleontology, in a broader international context in order to gain public acceptance. The rivalry between Germany and the United States reached a climax during the first decade of the 20th century as German industry and research institutes sought to attain both public and private funding in order to catch up with the United States. At the same time, though, the United States was seen as a model to be emulated. However, both the Ministry of Education and the State Secretary for the Imperial Colony Office rejected Branca's appeal. They were extremely reluctant to fully finance a purely paleontological expedition means one that would not foster industrial expansion. But Germany was not alone here. As we know, American, British and French paleontology, like Weiss, found it extremely difficult to obtain any state funding for their expedition. In no one of this country was vertebrate paleontology seen as service the interests of the states or the development of industry. Yet Branca decided to slightly change uh, his communicative strategy by selecting a different target audience. With the help of pathologist Hans Mann, he established a committee to launch an eff efficient public fundraising campaign and asked the most influential academic and non-academic personalities to join, uh, uh, to join the board in, all, in the hope of attracting sufficient funding. With such committee in place, Branca decided to launch his public fundraising campaign. Their first move was to advertise the dinosaurs' finds in various local and national newspapers, as well as in the popular science magazines. In fact, even the news of the establishment of the Tindaguru Committee was welcomed with great enthusiasm. The newspaper Tiglische Rundschau noticed it was almost certain that this committee will spark great interest in Germany. In 99, the committee chose the popular weekly journal Naturwissenschaftliche Wochenschrift to place a fundraising advertisement. After briefly describing the importance of this expedition, the committee expected cited the competitive emulation of the United States in order to achieve its goal. It would be desirable for this enterprise to be energetically supported by local friends of the sciences following the example set by American sponsors. As a result, great excitement arose in the Prussian Empire about the paleontological findings, with various applications arriving at the museum from people eager to accompany the paleontologists in Tanzania. 
What is more, a number of companies, so Tendaguru, is a good vehicle for advertising their products. For example, the food company Maggi offered Branca its support for the excavation of the German treasures in the form of a box, and a quote, with all our products free of charge for the expedition. First and foremost, though, uh, through the newspaper advertisement, sorry, the newspaper advertisement gave rise to generous voluntary donations from the German middle classes, who were eager to see the German expedition and their dinosaur spoons bigger than the American ones. But Branca went a step further, seeking to directly contact rich persons who might be interested in the enterprise. For instance, the German animal merchant Karl Hagenbeck was so convinced of the significance of this expedition that he replied to Branca, these excavations are a national work. We Germans must be on a par with Americans who simply have the good fortune that wealthy Americans have invested huge capital in their ex excavations. He went on to assert, if the Americans can do it, so we can, and we must not own any account fell behind them. Furthermore, he proposed addressing a circular to all the German schools, asking the primary school children to donate five pfennings per person and high school students ten pfennings per person to support this expedition. Hence, Branca's communicative strategy was extremely successful. He gathered enough research to excavate a huge, a huge volume of paleontological remains, send them to Berlin, and prepare them. This was so effective that even the process central state um, eventually decide to financially support the 1912 excavation season, as I have pointed out. Uh, this was an important victory. In fact, vertebrate paleontology, as uh, was the case for other so-called field sciences like archaeology, ethno ethnography, ethnology, was for the most part financed by private philanthropists, both in Europe and elsewhere. But yet, what kind of service could uh, a discipline detached from industry offered to the state. Prussia uh, decided to support these expeditions uh, not because it would convince that paleontology was able to foster the state's industrial development as chemistry or physics, or physics did, but rather because it played a significant role in promoting German nationalism. Branca decided to market the value of paleontology by taking advantage of this particular <coughs> aspect. Indeed, he noticed that the unexpected treasure of the Tendaguru expedition was due to the fact that the excavation revealed an incredible wealth of forms and remains of normal reptiles, and I quote, their size outshone what was already known so far. They eclipsed even the American giant's find. The emperor himself was expressed his warm interest in scientific as well as national enterprise. Quote ends. By 1912, then, the Tendaguru expedition had indeed become a national enterprise, increasing the prestige of a state seeking to compete with other states politically, economically, and socially. So, to conclude, the epistemic features of the German paleontology were bound up with the ability to obtain funding and those with the ability of paleontologists to persuade. Uh, uh, to persuade first Prussia and then the entire German Empire of the value of the discipline. Indeed, through his public relation campaign, Branca succeeded in convincing the Prussian central state uh, to, regard, uh, to regard a non lucrative discipline, vertebrate paleontologists, as important, as important for the national prestige of the German Empire, and thus secured the money required to launch his research program. What is more, it also played on the German imperial desire to compete with and emulate American science. The message was that if Americans were able to finance paleontology and excavate enormous dinosaurs, not only could the Germans do that wise, but they could even overtake the Americans. Following paleontologist Stephen J. Gould, I refer to this fundraising activity as the paleontological beggar game. Good, notice with reference to the movie Jurassic Park, that uh, not, uh, natural history is and has always been a beggar game. Our work has never been funded by or for itself. We have always depended upon patrons and upon other people's perception of the utility of our data. Many, 
but not all of this partnership have been honorable from our point of view. But we have never had the upper end. Quite the contrary, our end has always been out. Paleontological Becker's game characterized not only German 19th and early century paleontology, but also American, but also its American counterpart. Furthermore, as we notice, it's played a pivotal role in the establishment of paleobiology as, a, as, as an independent uh, science. Hence, my focus on the paleontological beggar games help us dynamize the static and monolithic distinction between science popularization, on the one hand, and production of knowledge. But yet, uh, to what extent does these beggar games constitute and constrain natural history? Or to put it differently, how does communication dictate, create, and constrain the development and diffusion of specific epistemic agenda? Branca was able to impose his model of paleontology over his peers only by taking advantage of the fortuitous discovery of the giant bones in German East Africa. These remains were found by chance by a German mining engineering in German East Africa. It was only by accident that the bones survived a series of taphonomic processes designed to destroy them and were fragmentarily preserved in their archive. Thus, Branca's success was determined by a series of chance and contingent events. And it was that it, and it was this that enabled Branca to capture the public's imagination and thus establish his authority. Hence Branca's success uh, which derived from a series of contingent events, was ultimately the result of a game of chance. This revealed how communication and knowledge production are related. The success of Branca Enterprise depends on the epistemic, social, and economic circumstances that enable its communications. Beggar games are always part of and result from diverse forms of life. While the historical and ugly contingent circumstances that enabled Branca to stage an effective public relations campaign and to mobilize money and people shaped the production of, of, the, the production of natural knowledge, it did not constitute natural knowledge per se. Communication can intensify and catalyze research program, and it can shape scientific practice and scientific practice, but it does not constitute them. Thus, paleontologist Otin Abel, availing himself um, of the new landscape of German, of German science, blamed Branca and the Berlin School for communicating spectacular discoveries by not looking for broader biological causes. If the Berliners want to create paleontology, they should go ahead, because there are other places to pursue paleontology. Vienna, for instance, is progressing nicely in this way. Nevertheless, it's a shame that paleontology is systematically neglected in Germany. So it would be good to reflect on what can be done to add its decline. Thank you. <laughs>